Welcome, everybody. I want to thank you all for joining us for today's Fair Vote webinar, How We Win in 2022. We will get started in just a moment. I want to give everybody a chance to join us before we officially begin. Certainly, I know there's a lot of news right now and how overwhelming so much of it can be. So we really do appreciate you spending this hour with us. I know it will be a worthwhile one, and um, I hope we can leave you with some optimism about what's possible for our democracy over the next year, about the victories that have been achieved, uh, those that are underway, and the real sense that together, all of us with your support, we really can win in 2022 and in the years to come. Let's just give folks a moment or two to join us. I see that number keeps climbing. So thank you all once again for being part of this. Um, all right. I think that's a great number. Let's get started. Um, welcome once again. I want to thank you all for being here, for your support for Fair Vote, for your passion for the electoral reform we need to strengthen our democracy and to ensure that every vote matters. I'm David Daly, a senior fellow at Fair Vote, the author of two books on voting rights and electoral reform, most recently Unrigged, How Americans Are Battling Back to Save Democracy. There is a lot of concern about the state of our democracy. We are not here today to wring our hands or describe the problems. We know the problems. We also have a vision of what our democracy can be and a demonstrable plan for how we get there. So today, we are going to talk about how we win and how we start winning in 2022. This year also marks Fair Vote's 30th anniversary. We have some tremendous events planned to mark that occasion, including our annual Democracy Awards live and in person once again this year in April in New York. We've seen so many of the reforms that Fair Vote has advocated for become enacted, become part of the mainstream of our politics, but this has truly become our moment for ranked choice voting and for fair representation. Ranked choice voting has more momentum than any other democracy reform, and we are building off a year that saw it expanded nationwide by more voters than in any other year. There is also growing consensus among thought leaders of all ideological perspectives that the Fair Representation Act, multi-member congressional districts, ranked choice voting, proportional representation that awards seats in accordance with each party's share of the vote is not only the best way to counter the extreme partisan gerrymandering that has become so common, but also to detoxify our polarized politics and re-incentivize our leaders to respond to everyone. So how do we build off all of this energy with reforms that match this moment? That is what we will talk about today. I am joined by a tremendous panel of Fair Vote colleagues who are doing important, inspiring work. They'll fill us in on how they see the important road unwinding ahead. I will pose the first questions to everyone, but we also want to invite you to be part of this discussion. We will leave plenty of time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask, use the Q&A function below at any time. Uh, our Fair Vote team will be monitoring those fields. Let me introduce today's panel. Angela Cowders is Fair Vote's Director of Governmental Affairs. Angela has held senior roles on Capitol Hill, national campaigns, and within the Obama administration. She served as Chief of Staff for Representative Jerry McInerney, Representative Glenn Nye, and then Representative Betty Sutton. Angela also served in the Obama administration as Director of Congressional Affairs at the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, and then the U.S. Department of Homeland Security serving as the Acting Director of Legislative Affairs. In addition to her governmental service, she has held senior roles at the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, Emily's List, and on two presidential campaigns. Brian Cannon is Fair Vote's Director of Advocacy. He's coming to us from Virginia, where for the better part of the last decade, he worked on bipartisan redistricting reform. After successfully navigating a tricky state legislature, twice under different party control, he won passage of a state constitutional amendment that ended partisan gerrymandering. In the what's next mentality of every good reformer, Brian has joined with Fair Vote to work on ranked choice voting as director of advocacy, focusing on state and local movements to improve the way we vote. Deb Otis is Fair Vote's senior research analyst. She is a founding member of Voter Choice Massachusetts, the campaign to win RCV statewide. 
in Massachusetts, and she joined Fervo to continue that work supporting electoral reform at the national level. Deb's research focuses on representation for women and people of color, congressional dysfunction, political polarization, election recounts, and runoff elections. Rob Ritchie is Fairvote's CEO and co-founder. Over the past 30 years, he's been catalyzing electoral reforms that have helped make ranked choice voting the nation's fastest growing electoral reform. He's had pieces in more than 10 books in our nation's leading publications and is focused on helping scale our efforts as our work rises to the next level of impact. Um, thank you all for being with us. Angela, why don't we start on Capitol Hill? It is tough to get things done on the Hill, but we've just seen a terrific example of how we can achieve success. Give us your sense of the current state of play, particularly on questions of democracy reform. Sure. So, you know, you know, as a reminder of just fair votes growth, you know, as it is our 30th year, like the Department of Government Affairs, particularly as it relates to congressional outreach is new to fair vote. It has grown into this. Um, it didn't exist. And so we kind of, you know, in coming in and building out this department, it was we need to develop relationships because we know that if we develop relationships on the Hill, we can educate, we can build a program, we can develop a coalition towards ranked choice voting. Um, you know, that was our theory of the case at the time. Uh, and we just kind of watched Congress be very polarizing and in kind of a shocking way, particularly around voting reform, which historically has, you know, least the Voting Rights Act has always been bipartisan. Um, so we really saw, saw deadlock. And so when in looking at like developing the you know, the relationships with members, we wanted to, you know, take advantages where we could see them. And we were actually successful for the first time uh, in Fair Votes um, time in developing a Congressional Affairs Office of getting a piece of legislation introduced within a very short and late night on 11 p.m. on a Thursday, you know, to led to council, got it introduced out of committee, got it attached to a package, got it passed out of the House of Representatives. Um, and now that legislation is sitting. So like, as there may be some movements in the Senate, it's something that obviously you know we're looking at, and that was our uh, the Voter Choice Act with Congressman uh, Dean Phillips in the House, um, and that was our success in December. And so, as we're looking at this legislative session, things have really kind of shifted. Um, you know, the current political environment has changed, obviously around the world, but also at home. Um, you know, there's unfolding, you know, the you can't, Ukrainian crisis is going to take up a good bit of time and oxygen. Uh, and then you also have the truncated schedule with the current congressional funding. And we also have a Supreme Court nomination that has to go through the Senate. All of this pushes back the traditional scheduling of Congress moving its 12 appropriation bills. Um, and so we are going to continue doing what we've been doing which is educating on like our bills of priority and building those relationships um, and, and really planning out our program. Dave, unmute yourself. Uh, tell me more about the Dean Phillips uh, bill and what is in there and why it's so important. Sure, so, you know, when you're really trying to, at the end of the day, like get something that's not controversially passed, but move, advance the reform. Um, so you're educating members on the, the system itself. Um, you know, one of the easiest ways to do that is like, well, let's upgrade equipment um, and it makes it compatible. That moves us down the field. And so this bill literally moves money to the states to modernize their voting systems to be ranked choice voting compatible. Um, and so it's, it's not, it's not controversial. Everybody agrees that you know updated voting equipment is a good idea for security measures for lots of different arguments. And so it was really great to you know be able to take that. And it wasn't a bill that was in a part of uh, the HR one package that we kind of saw get get swallowed up last year. So um, there was oxygen to move it. Um, and it's something that you know both Republicans and Democrats like if we can make the case for case you know cost savings. Um, that's where you can draw some bipartisan uh, measures. That's a great victory. Um, you have seen big change get made on the Hill. Um, how has your experience, what has it taught you about how big change 
is one, how our vision is achievable. Is it through a series of smaller steps like this? Is it through that kind of education? You know, I think it's, in politics and particularly Capitol Hill, you're responding to the environment. Who is in, who is in power in which chamber, um, who is in, you know, in the White House that defines a lot of like the agenda setting, um, you know, and so I think it is always good to have a long vision uh, of, of, of what the long game is of what we want. In the meantime, we should be educating and it is, I've seen in my time as a chief of staff in times in the you know, minority and majority, you can move smaller pieces of legislation faster. It's easier to get small things adapted and familiarized um, with both staff and the members and build the right coalition. That's so important to have the right partners with you at the table when you're doing this work. Um, and so, you know, it, and bring people with you so that you broaden that. Um, and I've seen it, you know, and then when you're in the minority, you have to get creative because at the same time, you're still governing. You're still going to be responsible to, you know, your constituents. You're still running for reelection. Um, you know, you still have work to do. Um, and then in the Senate, it's, it's a different game. Um, so, you have to have the large sweeping reform like we saw with Obamacare. But like the what went into Obamacare wasn't just the two years and the legislative efforts and the hundreds of millions of dollars. It would be years of like policy research and like familiarizing people with systems and having healthcare advocates, you know, educating members and staff. Um, and then when the political winds opened up the opportunity, you, you know, there was we move and move fast. Big wins can happen. Big reform can happen. It can happen when few people even imagine it um, being inside the realm of possibility, which is a good moment to bring Brian Cannon, our director of advocacy, into this conversation. Because when Brian ran One Virginia um, and achieved redistricting, a, a victory there, no state legislature in the nation had ever voluntarily relinquished any control over this important process. Uh, Brian, tell us what you learned on that campaign, how it informs your work going forward on ranked choice voting. Sure, thanks Dave. Um, well, I, I'd be remiss if probably in this moment if I didn't start by saying that uh, while I was uh, a, a very early in my journey as uh, running the thing and the work in Virginia, uh, I read this great book, uh, Rat F, whose name I can't fully pronounce, um, about this guy who did, went all over the country and looked at other reforms and other uh, where they worked and where they didn't. And that really informed us. And I think if you're nerdy enough to be on this webinar today, you're, you're of that uh, like mind. Um, and so I think it's, it's really helpful for everybody to just be as much of an uh, expert on this as you can, but also realize that when you're talking to legislators and, and other just people who care and who are plenty smart, that they have no clue what your issue is, even though like, you know, redistricting reform was the biggest issue for me last decade. It's it's ranked choice voting now, and um, you know, but 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 be the expert, and I I think embrace that. I'd also say, um, you know, we work really hard at Fair Vote. One of my big jobs is to make sure uh, we have uh, Republican and Democratic allies to to step forward, uh, and we did that in Virginia, and um, we got heat for it um, because when the Republicans were in control, any Democrat we had, they'd say, "See, you guys are just a bunch of communists," and uh, you know, and, and vice versa. When the when the Democrats gained control, they would say, "Oh, I can't believe you would ever work with that Republican." Um, but but what what it meant for us is that we were really staying true to the issue as a nonpartisan issue. I mean, you have to operate in a partisan environment. That's fine, but the issue itself is is nonpartisan. It doesn't uh, cut one way or another. It's just a, a better way to do. To do business, and uh, and and that's what what we were pushing. So I think you know, realize you need those bipartisan allies. Be unapologetic in that uh, in your in your state outreach and, and efforts, because there are good folks on both sides of the aisle that support this. Um, another thought I have is uh, sell the problem we're trying to fix. And and what I mean by that is the status quo sucks. So go ahead and talk about that fact. Um, the current way we vote or the current way we redistricted last second, it's just not that great of a system. So, uh, you know, it's not that ranked choice voting or redistricting reform or any of these things are a, are a silver bullet to fix the, everything that's wrong with our republic. But 
these can go a long way and they're much, much better than, than the status quo. So I think you got to sell the, the, the problem. And then uh, let me give a shout out to uh, the folks at, at Rank the Vote and all the grassroots organizers who do work in here in, in this space. Um, that was the key to our success in Virginia. Um, when when uh, I became executive director of One Virginia, we had like 3,500 supporters. Uh, six years later, when I left, we had almost 150,000. Um, and that was because we had awesome grassroots volunteers that went out. They would be at DMV lines uh, uh, on, on Saturday mornings, signing people up uh, in key legislative districts. And I'm happy to go into any of those details if anybody ever wants. But, um, but I'll just say that that grassroots work really matters because when the parties flipped in our legislature, um, that was what kept people uh holding firm firm to us um so yeah so uh, you know i kind of looked up after the deck after the, you know this decade was over this past decade was over and and it's obvious to me uh, and you mentioned it in your opening dave ranked choice voting is the fastest growing democracy reform in the country for a lot of reasons um and we need to kind of make this decade the 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 improve our our voting equals ranking um decade in our mind I feel like what you accomplished in Virginia is so important in this moment because we're talking at a time in which the two parties are increasingly dug in. They are are dug in even on democracy issues, unable to find agreement there. Um, beyond that kind of grassroots support, are there other strategies that can help us get to victory at a time in which it's so hard to find agreement and build consensus? Um, yeah, Dave, you know, I think that on the policy side of this is where a lot of that comes in. You got to have the grassroots support, the energy and the momentum, uh, but you also have to have a policy that's viable. And I, I think, you know, what we did in Virginia, you know, I wanted an A plus Cadillac independent, fully independent commission like Michigan or California has, we couldn't get all of that through our state legislature. We got a pretty darn good one, but we didn't get the, the Cadillac plan. Uh, so I think you gotta be willing to lay down some bunts and some singles uh, and get some runners on the base. Uh, and and, uh, and fair vote strategy in that uh, on the policy side, I think is is really smart. Uh, one of the big plays that's, that's happening right now is uh, pushing for ranked choice voting in presidential primaries. Uh, that has a lot of advantages um, and then you can also uh, ask, ask state legislatures to pass local options bills, which allows localities like in Virginia, where they have to ask permission uh, to pass local uh, local ordinances for uh, for ranked choice voting. And, and, and that gives us a lot of opportunities to get in there and try ranked choice voting out without it impacting um, you know, per se, a state legislative race or a gubernatorial race or things like that. Uh, though I will say that um, Virginia Republicans experienced the benefits of of ranked choice voting in their primary system this past year, and they nominated the strongest ticket they've ever put forward. So uh, that's another option for for you know getting getting on base. There is is to use it in nomination processes, not just presidential primaries, but others. Uh, that way, from a partisan perspective, because while we're nonpartisan, um, that's the first thing people say: is it going to benefit my team or another? If you're in the state legislature, uh, if you just do it in a nomination contest. You're going to nominate whatever whoever party owns that. It's just you know it's a better a better way to do business, um, and I I think that's those are the kind of policy changes that kind of complement that grassroots energy that give legislators a okay we could try that. All of these baseball metaphors you're making me uh, lonely for opening day. Um, <laughs> maybe what we need is a strategy to get baseball back as well. Um, it's. It's still early 2022, but I love that you're thinking about presidential primaries uh, because uh, we're really not that far away from the 2024 presidential campaign. And this is where I duck um, because I'm sure everybody is not quite ready for that, but you know, probably going to be the first debates next year, early primaries not long after that. People might not know the number of uh, uh, states that used ranked choice voting for presidential primaries in 2022. Um, I would love to hear more about that. Why was that so important? What are we doing to expand that work as we head into this next cycle? Yeah, well, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to take credit for that all, but but uh, but I was not on staff at the time, and and a lot of folks worked really hard uh, to not only get 
state legislatures to or, or state parties to see this as a viable option, but then also to to help uh, fund it from a nonprofit standpoint to make sure that the election went smoothly and it went really, really well. I've talked to folks in Hawaii who who who, who, who did it last time. I, I talked to to folks in Nevada and and in, in Kansas and other places, and and it's they they had a great. Um, uh, system. Uh, now, as, as we all know, the 2024 cycle gives us a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a change because the Democrats are likely to change things up. Uh, Iowa may not go first anymore, or at least that's a question. Nevada shifting from a caucus to a state run primary. Um, so things are changing, but that gives us an opportunity in, in the presidential primary spaces. And also, Maine has come on board. So Maine is going to do it through a state room primary. Uh, and, and we feel really good about, uh, about that going forward. Um, and, and we're working with a base of probably five states right now that are going to do it um, uh, going forward for the Democratic uh, primary in 24. And um, you're, you're there, the other possible states are Virginia is going to have it um, up in the legislature again next year for a state run primary. It might do that. Washington state uh, will have it there. Uh, and for the, for example, Washington State, this is like one of my favorite stats from from my friend Deb, my colleague Deb, is that 25 percent of the votes in Washington State by the time they got to the presidential primary, which was a week after Super Tuesday, 25 percent of the votes were cast for somebody who's already out. Right. So it's a it's a no brainer way for, for them to do it. It's a really good opportunity as well for the state election administrators. And I think of folks like Amber McReynolds and others who, who are in this space and who talk about this. It's an easy election to do. Right, Dave, because it gives you just you just have one, just the presidential one. You don't have other, you know, complicated things on the ballot. You don't have a three page ballot. You just got whoever's running for president. And that's and you, so you can rank them. So it's a good way to, to, to put some points on the board. I'd also keep uh, your eyes peeled. Vermont and Colorado have bills. Um, I think there's going to we're, we're looking at a, at a number of states that are going to adopt ranked choice voting. And then voila, you'll see have so many more people using it. Um, and everybody who uses ranked choice voting, I mean, just overwhelmingly, they think it's easy. They think it's simple. It makes sense. And they're happy to do it again. Lots and lots of ways to put runners on base and move them around the base paths. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think the number, Rob, would know the exact number, uh, I bet down to down to the decimal point, but um, I think it was over 3 million voters um, at one point in, in, in 2020 that, um, you know, effectively uh, uh, lost their voice uh, by casting a ballot for a candidate that had uh, dropped out for a phantom candidate in 2020. And, you know, certainly um, there's a possibility of open, open contests on both sides in 2024. One doesn't know at this point. So that number really could move up. Um, and so uh, that seems like a good segue to bring in our research uh, star uh, and the numbers guru at Fairvote um, and welcome Deb Otis. Um, Deb, um, really nothing makes the case for change quite like numbers like that. Uh, strong research. Um, would you take me through what the research team's priorities are for 2022? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Dave. We have a full docket of research work that we want to dig into this year. Um, one of the big things that we're working on is our Monopoly Politics Report. We are celebrating 25 years of putting out this report that we title Monopoly Politics. We uh, pioneered this methodology a couple of decades ago, and over the last 25 years, the trends have been really stark. This is a report that analyzes congressional elections. We use it to demonstrate the dysfunction that exists in Congress right now as we make the case for the Fair Representation Act, for reform in Congress. And so monopoly politics looks at things like how it hardly matters who is running, which candidates are on the ballot, whether it's an incumbent running or an open seat. The only thing that has come to matter over the last decades is how red or how blue is that district? We can predict the winners of 80% of districts, usually two years out, two years ahead of, a, of congressional elections, we already know who's going to win the next cycle. And so the Monopoly Politics Project digs into why that is. Uh, part of it is gerrymandering, um, part of it is political polarization, but it shows how things aren't working right now. And so as we go into this midterms year, uh, we'll be looking a lot at congressional dysfunction. Um, another project, we will be telling the story of the 
a primary problem. Uh, the way that candidates in primary elections often win with a small, narrow percentage of the vote. That has been true over the past few cycles. We're looking forward to digging into that again. Some states are already uh, partly on board with some of, the, uh, some of the values of ranked choice voting. We've got about 10 states that do runoff elections in primaries. So I'm looking forward to keeping a close eye on those runoff states. In fact, Texas will be kicking it all off. Uh, they are the first state to, do, to vote in uh, congressional primaries. They'll be voting this week. And then they will have runoff elections for any offices that don't have a majority winner in this first round. And so, We'll be taking a look at how much are those runoffs costing and who is voting in those? Has um, it, how much of the turnout drop is there? And are we seeing the turnout disparity differ between different types of voters? So that's one of the projects I'm looking forward to doing this year. And lastly, we've got a full schedule of ranked choice voting elections this year, including some places using it for the first time, like some high profile elections in Alaska, we've got a gubernatorial race and a Senate race that we're keeping a close eye on. And we'll be analyzing the results from that. We'll be looking at uh, how, how was the voter turnout? How did people use the rankings? Uh, did ranked choice voting appear to change candidate behavior or voter behavior? And so we want to do a thorough analysis of, of that election in Alaska, as well as congressional races in Maine and municipal races in dozens of cities coming up this fall. So those are some of the research projects we wanna do as we work to make the case. I wanna make this data-driven case for how ranked choice voting works in practice to support the priorities that Angela and Brian and have talked about for uh, for their departments. Is there a connection? As I heard you talk there, I'm struck by the primary problem and monopoly politics. So on one hand, we have these these frozen red and blue districts, and then on the other hand, we have these these primaries that you can win with 21 percent of the vote in some cases, and effectively then walk into a seat in Congress. What does the data show about the, the links between monopoly politics and the primary problem? I think this research is absolutely key to making the case for the Fair Representation Act. You know, our monopoly politics report shows how polarized each of these districts is. We are electing our House of Representatives, our 435 members, each from a single district. And now we know gerrymandering can be a problem in determining who, uh, uh, determining how these districts are drawn. Uh, these fights this year have been contentious. It's been expensive. Uh, it, at times, it's felt like it has infringed on people's rights. But at the end of it, it feels like both parties have become more entrenched. The districts that leaned one way are now firmly safe districts. And the number of these competitive seats where voters have a meaningful say is dropping sharply. This is a trend that we've been seeing over the last few decades. And this year is expected to be a 25 year low for the number of competitive districts and the number of voters who have a meaningful say. And so uh, the goal of this research is to take folks on, on this journey to understanding how these single winner districts are the root of a lot of the problems that we all recognize. Uh, my colleague Brian mentioned earlier today, the status quo sucks. I think a lot of us acknowledge the problems that we're facing, the dysfunction in Congress. And we're showing how our single winner districts are the root of that. We are taking folks on this journey of understanding how the way we have built our districts is what leads to this polarization and to the, to the incentives for gerrymandering and to a lot of voters feeling like they have no voice in the process. And these facts together um, build understanding of what is the problem and let us start making progress on the solution. The Fair Representation Act, our key uh, voting reform. So we will be working on uh, implementing multi-member districts with proportional ranked choice voting to elect our Congress people. Uh, it's really meaningful work and I'm excited for the progress that we're gonna make this year. Finally, I want to welcome our CEO and co-founder Rob Ritchie. Um, Rob, how do you see this moment? Um, what do you think has changed to bring these ideas into the heart of the conversation? And what makes you hopeful in this moment? Uh, I think you're on mute. There we go. I'm turning on sound. Uh, anyway, thanks, Dave. And it's been great to hear my colleagues and see uh, a lot of people on uh, for this conversation. So 
uh, appreciative of all of that. And um, you know, we're obviously in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a challenging time for our country and for a, a essentially a basic um, a commitment to, to democracy and elections kind of across the spectrum, I think is something that we need to all sort of stand together for. When we started 30 years ago, we, you know, I was there, Bill Collins is on this webinar, helped help with our founding conference, playing a huge role. A lot of us thought big changes were needed, but it was interesting that back then, where the definition of the problem was, I think, a little bit different. They, the major parties were, were, were seen as, as, as really hip-locked. There was a sense of a duopoly, and we needed like a, a, a resuscitation. So our first name was Citizens for Proportional Representation Resuscitating Democracy. Um, and that was, I, I think, the, 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 definition, the definition of a problem that's real and true. But I think what, is, what has evolved over the years is that sense of what it means to be deadlocked and gridlocked and that the number of people that now agree, we need to have a, a big fundamental question about uh, or conversation about structural reform really goes deep into the major parties, goes deep into high uh, our top elected officials are really struggling with what's going on. Um, and it's interesting because I, as, as I think over the 30 years, you know, there's been flashpoints. But when we started, like Democrats had run the House for 40 years, um, and, and that was sort of almost a given in the 94 election, kind of put that in play and, 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 and triggered this sort of intense control and fight for the House that ultimately, I think, contributed to sort of national polarization, the 2000 election the Gore-Bush race and, and all that came with that and a, a big conversation about election administration, but then about the Electoral College and about the role of Ralph Nader and, and ranked voting uh, came to a fore. Um, then as you know, Barack Obama got elected and are we moving to a post-racial democracy? And I think an expect a realization we're not and, and, and how, how can we become a fully successful multiracial democracy? And I think what, what connects these threads is the opportunity to say, look, we have to get to the root of how our votes translate into power, how our votes, votes translate into seats and representation, how they create incentives for uh, both voters to participate in a meaningful way and for our elected officials to act in a responsible way. And I think that um, it's really created a lot of allies. So we have lots of groups working on this, so many more groups and allies at the national level, at the state level, we have philanthropists who are coming in big time um, and you know, state groups emerging every day. Um, nonetheless, we'll say winning uh, matters. Uh, and and um, we had some really important wins along the way. I'm really proud of basically almost every year something moved that, that was exciting. We, 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 we had a big role in things other than ranked choice voting and proportional voting on the electoral college, on voter registration, had a string of big city wins. It's the 20th anniversary this month of San Francisco as the first win for ranked choice voting. But winning it in Maine, having the Mainers come together for a big win to win it, defend it against really tough odds, make it work, expand it to presidential elections in 2020 so it's used for all their big federal races now, really was inspiring to a lot of people. It was this light of hope about what the change that can be possible. And I think it's really fired the imagination of a lot of people. And I think, um, you know, now we see Alaska about poised to use a really significant use of ranked choice voting. And I think this belief that, oh, we can actually do this. And uh, you know that's something that's really been exciting. A big year in Alaska coming up indeed, a big year on, uh, on all of these fronts. Um, so uh, tell me where you see us at the end of this year. If you look ahead in that crystal ball, um, where do you imagine FairVote and its reform partners to be at the end of this year? My colleagues have touched on a lot of things that I hope happen. So all of that, um, I'll, I'll lift up a few things. I want our reforms to work. Uh, you know, Deb was talking about, um, you know, studying Alaska and, uh, you know, Alaska and Maine are both gonna have big uses of, of ranked choice voting at the federal level this um, November, uh, Alaska also for governor. Um, a lot of city elections are still using it. Um, Virginia Republicans look like they're, they're gonna use it in a couple of congressional nominations. We want our reforms to work and we wanna keep telling that story. Um, we want our reforms to win. Um, and there may be a, a, another Alaska type ballot measure in Missouri. Keep an eye on that one for, for, for that particular model of this sort of top four uh, form of ranked choice voting in a really interesting state, a lot bigger than Alaska. Um, there may be a, a measure in Alaska, in Nevada. Um, but what Fairboat itself is gonna be mostly focused on is, is, is advancing what it can mean in state legislatures, 
what you've heard for, for Congress and what, what people can do at the local level in cities. And, and there's, there's a lot of uh, great city groups. There's a, a, an allied group called Rank the Vote that is helping a lot of um, our um, uh, state allies with creating the conditions for more wins. So we've gone up to more than 50 cities using ranked choice voting. We'd like to see 500 by 2025. We saw Utah go from two in 2019 to 23 cities wanted to do it last year. That, I don't know if they can multiply again by 10, but hey, um, why not? And, and, and um, you know, but I think that that's something that can happen all over the place. And, and that's, that's truly exciting. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll see some really uh, important progress on that. Um, and we really wanna keep impacting the conversation. Ultimately, we need to reach a national consensus that we can't maintain these rules and maintain what we want our representative democracy to be. We have to make a choice. And if we want our representative democracy to be all that it should be, we actually have to look at statutory changes, right? To, to open the single choice ballot to a ranked choice ballot, to open representation from single choice to, 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 to multi-member districts and proportional voting. And this is all within our reach. And in some ways it's an imperative that we do so. And we need to have just that, that coalition of the willing extend deeper and deeper. And I think uh, that's where I hope we have made big, big progress in the next year. We have reached uh, the time for questions. Um, if you all still have questions, all of you out there, uh, use the Q&A field um, and leave them in there. Uh, and our fair vote team is monitoring that and sending them our way. We'll get to as many as we can in the 20 minutes or so that we have left. Um, let me start with Justin. Uh, who asks that it's uh, nice to see Jamie Raskin as a co-sponsor, but would like to see additional co-sponsors of the Fair Representation Act, wonder specifically about reps from Alaska or Maine, places, of course, that um, have got a, a, a history of adopting ranked choice voting. Um, I should throw that question over to Angela. Um, how are things um, as far as additional co-sponsors of the Fair Representation Act? You know, as as I said, as I said, like our priority in, is really just building out this operation. You know, we have reached out and have had numerous conversations with the, both of those delegations, um, and have also also partnered with uh, other organizations that regularly communicate with those offices regarding you know political positioning and also like what's moving, what's not. Um, you know, our as our relationships grow, as our education grows, as member bandwidth grows, you know, we hope to educate. Um, so absolutely, you know, we had a meeting with uh, Congressman Don Beyer from Virginia who really wants to grow the Fair Representation Act. So we're super eager to get his target list um, from his office so that we can really, you know, couple and partner with them uh, in those efforts. Um, but, you know, it's also, you know, it's, there's a lot going on with Congress. And so trying to get members attention to co-sponsor legislation that's not, you know, moving at this time is always a tricky time. A similar question from Mike DeRubis. Um, can you discuss different strategies for moving these reforms forward in legislative states, such as Wisconsin, which require a different path than states that allow for ballot measures? That seems like a natural uh, for Brian Cannon to take on. Uh, yeah, Dave, I, so I think that's a great question, and, and that's what we had to do in Virginia. We didn't have a ballot option. We had to go through the legislature twice. So uh, I'm hopeful for the work in, in Wisconsin. I know that the, the final five effort up there has assembled uh, just an a, a awesome, awesome team with uh, Catherine and Austin as kind of the, the I think, the co-chairs of it, and then, a, and then a good grassroots network there. And I know um, the, the Rank My Vote folks out there in, in Wisconsin are also doing good work. Um, you know, I, th I think it's a matter of you got to find your 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 opportunity targets with legislators. There's 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 bound to be a legislator, probably on both sides of the aisle, that will support it in theory. Now, will they come out for it? I don't know. But I mean, what we did in Virginia was we just we would take all the options we could possibly think of for different ways to do it. So for ranked choice voting, that would mean presidential primaries, nominating processes, local options, school board options, things like that, just to see what might start to stick. Um, and then explain, you know, how this would work and how, how it, you know, it's not as partisan as they, as, I mean, everybody in the state legislature puts things through a left to right funnel and, and ranked choice voting just really doesn't fit that. 
Um, and, and the more you get them thinking about that, the more you will. But I'll tell you, it's a multi-year process. So it's, you know, in 2015, and we didn't have it done. I, I started Virginia in 2015. The organization had started in 2014, and we didn't finish until 2020. So that was six years. Uh, and I think that's a reasonable timeline for state legislative uh, victories of, of a sizable nature. Hopefully you can get some, to go back to an earlier metaphor, singles and doubles um, before then, but but that's what you got to do. But let me be clear, um, it can get done and it's gotten done through legislatures uh, in other ways. And, and there's, and especially city councils and things like that. And there's just a lot of opportunities here to push and just have a conversation with it. And all, all I'll, else I'll say is please keep it bipartisan, right? And, and the issue nonpartisan. Ian Warren asks, how does ranked choice voting work in a presidential primary where voting across the country is drawn out over several months? What is the threshold for eliminating candidates? Adeb, Rob, either of you want to jump in on, on the mechanics of how you would uh, see this process working? Uh, sure, I can hop in. Uh, as Brian spoke, uh, we had four states already used ranked choice voting for Democratic presidential primaries last cycle. And the goal of putting ranked choice voting in a presidential primary is to make sure your delegates get assigned to the candidates with the most support from the voters. So in these Democratic uh, primaries where the threshold typically is 15% for a candidate to get delegates, when you use RCV, you keep that same 15% threshold. So when candidates below that threshold get eliminated, those votes go and count for those voters next choice. So the vote stays in play, exactly as Brian said earlier, particularly helpful if you voted for a candidate who then dropped out right before your state goes to vote if you voted early. Uh, in many uh, primaries on the Republican side, these are winner take all rather than delegates to anyone above a threshold. And so in those cases, it would be just like standard ranked choice voting where you go down to the one winner who gets the delegates. And Rob, th th this, this, it would have been extraordinarily meaningful, I would imagine, in 2016. And I think it could have been extraordinarily meaningful in 2020. What kind of impact might it have made over the course of those two different elections? I think it's always hard to say for sure on outcomes is that people would have run differently, voters would have handled the race differently, and so on. So we can't like really ever say, oh, we know exactly what would have happened with plurality looking at a ranked choice voting contest and say, just looking at first choice. And similarly, we can't necessarily say what would have happened with ranked choice voting just by looking at plurality. That said, I think that we would have had a very different tenor to the campaigns. Um, you would have had candidates knowing that they needed to kind of build in real time a, a, a clearer coalition. Um, you know, as, as Donald Trump secured the Republican nomination in 2016, he actually didn't win a majority in a state until right toward the end of April uh, in the New York uh, primary after you know 35 contests in, so that all of his previous victories were by plurality. So if ranked choice voting had had been in play, there would have been a, a opportunity for voters to have backup choices. The candidates would have known that they uh, would have needed to uh, reach out to uh, to a more voters. You know the the Democratic field was also quite large, right, and and uh, even larger and. And and um, and I think Joe Biden, in a sense, kind of after the South Carolina primary, had almost like a ranked choice voting dynamic go on. But I think actually having a real one would have would have been all the better, and uh, and I think would have just created these positive incentives. It also, I think, just as Deb was saying, as you um, lifted up earlier, it just goes well with early voting, right? If you're going to have early voting, which a lot of people want to vote early, it gets a lot more votes to count. You should allow them to cast a ranked choice ballot. You know, like Washington State is debating whether to have ranked choice voting for presidential primaries. More than 25% of their ballots went to candidates who had already dropped out by the time they had counted. Like, come on, legislators, give those voters a chance to have a backup choice that counts. A question from Michael Keenig, um, who I know so well from Twitter. Good to see you here on Zoom. Um, what are the states that have realistic ballot initiatives this year? Uh, Brian, any thoughts on, on ballot initiatives or uh, states and cities where there are processes underway? Yeah, so there's a, there's a number of, of cities popping up all over the, the uh, country uh, that are gonna have ballot initiatives. Uh, looks like 
um, Fort Collins in Colorado is going to have San Diego, San Jose, some other places uh, like that. Um, there's two statewide ballot initiatives that I'm looking at, and, and Rob's an encyclopedia of this, so Rob, please jump in if I if I miss one or two here. But the the two that I, I think are are making the most headlines at this point that are that are on the ballot are getting close is uh, Nevada and Missouri, and uh, those are uh, final four, final five. Uh, options there. So that would be instant statewide uh, ranked choice voting in both of those places. Uh, Nevada has to do it twice. They've got to pass in, in 22 and then I believe in 24 for it to go into effect in 26. Um, so I, I thought Virginia had a long way to amend our constitution. Nevada has an even longer one. Um, but the uh, but those are those are two big ones going going up right now that we, that we know for sure. And I'll just add, I'm putting into chat in response to Mike's question, a link to a page, resource page we have on our site where we're tracking these as they happen um, or as they get identified. And Brian hit the top ones, but um, there will be more. And, and I think uh, great efforts to San Jose, San Diego, there's, there's, there's some real chances for, for, for exciting progress. Another good question about things we're up to in 2022, um, a very simple question of, what is fair vote action? Uh, Rob, did you want to talk about fair vote uh, action? I'll say fair vote action. Actually, fair vote action is having its 20th anniversary. Fair vote is having its 30th anniversary. For 19 of those years, fair vote action was a really uh, unstaffed, in a sense, almost portal for, for contributions to help ballot measures and advocacy efforts, 100% advocacy. So one way to think of fair vote action which all of us clock some fair vote action time. What happened last year is we started changing things so that we, we have money coming into fair vote action and we can clock some of our time to fair vote action. And that's our kind of advocacy time, trying to win Angela, trying to get things passed in Congress and, and Brian working, working uh, sleeves up in, in, in opportunities in states and cities and, and, and communications work that's a little more, you know, uh, talking about candidates and, and, and not necessarily endorsing candidates, but just talking about candidates and things like that can happen through Fair Vote Action. So we um, actually are gonna unfold a, a Fair Vote Action website soon and people can see uh, more about Fair Vote Action as sort of a living, breathing um, identity, but it has a great board of directors. Um, uh, Tom Wathen, an experienced uh, um, uh, leader in the environmental field is a chair, Andrew Yang is a, a board member of Fair Vote Action, uh, Lindsay Donnelly, Alice Underwood, and then all of the staff, you know, clock some time for Fair Vote Action. So as we kind of scale and start winning more and more, we'll have more and more of a presence in our Fair Vote universe with Fair Vote Action. Here's a good one. Um, can you talk about how independent redistricting commissions are doing this cycle and why you think we need to pursue multi-member districts rather than just independent commissions. Um, let me toss that towards Deb. Um, why is the Fair Representation Act the best structural solution um, to fix the problem of partisan gerrymander? That's a great question. Uh, thanks for tossing it to me. I guess, Dave, you might have been a great person to answer this as well. Um, Dave, did, I'm the moderator I, today. Yeah, well, you did a great piece of writing earlier this year. It was called Voters Had Their Say on Independent Redistricting Commissions, and then Partisans Ignored Them. And so in a number of states, the independent redistricting commissions have, have made strong headway. But in some other areas, it seems like the will of the voters who implemented those commissions and then the products produced by those commissions were essentially tabled. And so we see independent redistricting commissions as one step towards the solution, but certainly not all of it. As long as that independent redistricting commission is still drawing single winner districts, then we are still going to have issues of some communities being packed or cracked. Uh, we're going to have unequal partisan representation. There are going to be challenges with racial representation just by the nature of having only one representative come from each district. No matter how diverse that group of voters is, only one viewpoint is getting represented, which means a lot of voters then feel like they didn't have a stake in it and they don't have anyone in Congress who's on their side. So moving towards the Fair Representation Act, any district you're in, you would still be in a district with local representation, but your district would be bigger and you would have 
three or four or five representatives. And so most of us would be represented by members of multiple parties. Most districts, almost all districts in the US would have this mixed representation. And you know, then we've created, we've taken down the temperature on the politics a bit and created these opportunities for maybe legislators to collaborate a bit when they share a constituency. And so independent redistricting commissions are getting us part of the way. What we really need is to district ourselves out of single winner districts. Every district, a competitive district. Um, let me keep it with you, Deb. Um, and I'm sorry to um, bring up a painful news, but uh, this question starts with uh, Massachusetts uh, RCV um, losing at the ballot box uh, in 2020, 55, 45. Um, and Nick wants to know if there's instances where it has been defeated and brought back successfully as a ballot measure in subsequent elections. But I mean, I also think that there's a lot of, of good news in that, in that vote as well, um, especially when you look at the demographic breakdown and the, and the generational breakdown. Um, um, talk to me about Massachusetts and um, what happens to uh, pull victory out of, out of something other than, than victory. Dave, I think you're right that there is some good news in there, even though it was a defeat. Uh, first of all, if the campaign goes forward and, and runs again, when they're, you know, when, if they get back onto the ballot and in four years, six years, um, they would not be the first to come back from a defeat. Um, Alaska, in fact, they passed ranked choice voting uh, a couple of years ago. It was not their first time voting on it. Uh, and the second time was the charm. And so that's, that's still an option. But in Massachusetts for now, uh, the campaign is working on local victories. And there are a number of cities and towns in Massachusetts that are poised to uh, an act ranked choice voting. Um, the, some of the good news coming from that victory includes the number of municipalities where voters overwhelmingly supported that ballot question, even though it didn't pass statewide. So those are uh, essentially low hanging fruit. Um, and also some positive demographic news, uh, even though the, the statewide question failed narrowly, uh, voters under 30 supported it 80%. And so we're seeing young voters ready to embrace ranked choice voting. And I absolutely think that there's a path forward for more growth in Massachusetts. That's pretty great. Um, coming to you all from Massachusetts, I certainly hope so. Um, I, wanted, I wanna end this with a round robin for all of you um, because this is, this is a difficult moment. Um, I mean, it can be hard to work on this issue, it can be hard to work on this issue over a long period of time. Um, and in this moment, I think perhaps it can feel overwhelming to, to some folks. I, I would like to know where you all feel hopeful, where you get your energy to continue the, 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 the fight from uh, and to give us a sense of, of, of optimism and inspiration as we move forward into 2022. Um, and let me start with you, Brian. So uh, I'll, I'll say that no one thought we could get redistricting reform in Virginia. Um, and the biggest wind in our sails wasn't anything that happened in Virginia per se. It was what happened in other states. It was watching Katie Fahey at, in Michigan get redistricting reform there. It was watching uh, Sean Nicholson in, uh, in Missouri, Catherine Turser in Ohio, and, and the, the folks at Better Ballot Utah, Catherine, I'm blanking on her last name right now. Um, you know, it's all of that. So, so what I hope you, you all do, because this stuff is a long slog, um, but it's totally worth it. It's, it's the only thing that's really going to change our country for the better um, systematically. Uh, it's worth it, but draw, draw inspiration from the victories we've had. And there are so many of them, uh, red states, blue states, purple, you know, localities, people working their butts off to make this happen. And, and that's worth drawing inspiration from. And I'll, I'll say specifically for, for folks, I, I saw something in the chat about Florida and the governor's uh, likely going to sign a, a ban on ranked choice voting. You know, that it, that's a gut punch. And I'm so sorry, but uh, that doesn't mean we're done. It just means they're thinking about ranked choice voting. And so I think that, you know, sometimes it's two steps back, uh, but we gotta, we gotta make some steps forward and take inspiration from the other ones we get. Angela? 
You know, I think I really what I've learned in, you know, my 20 years over both, you know, between the House, the Senate, whether it was like the White House, the DHS, or I mean, where, whatever crisis we were managing in every given moment, there are wins to your plan. Like, and, and what's good with our plan is it's about education. It's about trying to have, um, you know, ranked choice voting, educate members. Um, and so I see the wins in the little things of how many more offices returned our calls, how many more people did we talk to how many more republicans have now learned about ranked choice voting how many um you know how are we growing and then knowing that like that growth we are taking this fight to them we have both the longer vision and our building capacity to get more creative legislatively um knowing when these moments to engage uh you know whether it's the authorizers and engage in legislative council and getting you know, the right partners on board um, is so critical. Um, and so, you know, yeah, the big wins are amazing and they feel great. But if you don't also like remember that like each one of these is also part of the larger game as well, um, you know, that's what keeps you motivated. And so like you get those like smaller wins and uh, that's why, you know, we keep plugging away. Deb, how about Hope? Well, my energy and enthusiasm always comes from the fact that the data is on our side. I'm, I'm representing the uh, research and data perspective on this call. And I'll tell you, when I started at FairVote two years ago, I, may, I had a, a little apprehension I, as, a, as a researcher. I wasn't sure if maybe there would be moments where my findings were, were bad and I had to argue with someone about whether we should publish it or bury it. Uh, and that never comes up because ranked choice voting is working in practice. Every time we get new election results, like last year, New York City, 90% of people using the rankings, voters overwhelmingly say that they like it and they want to keep it. Same story in Utah, where 20 new cities used it this year, voters overwhelmingly used the rankings and, and said that they were happy with their experience with ranked choice voting. So it feels like every time we get new data, it's good and it's telling the story and making the making the picture look even better. And that's why we are seeing such explosive growth in ranked choice voting because it is working and we can see that happening. Rob, I have to give you the unenviable task of following the enthusiasm of Deb Otis in this moment, uh, but uh, take us home um, and, and leave us on a high note of yeah. what we can achieve together. Well, thank you, Dave. And by the way, people should Google Dave Daly and books and writings and he keeps turning things out every day and every week. So, and, uh, and what it really is inspiring to me really is uh, you're getting a taste of it here is the, just the expansion of voices who so clearly and powerfully can make our case and are just emerging across the country. I mean, it's just the, the, the new leaders and the new, um, you know, perspectives coming in are truly inspiring. I wanted to lift up one particular, you know, uh, area of hope, which is Deb was talking about Massachusetts earlier, and the, you know, the one, the only real defeat, right, that ranked choice voting has had on the ballot for years at, at this point. And, um, but 80% of young people under 30 voted yes. We're up to about 100 colleges and universities where student government leaders have decided to go to ranked choice voting. It just is something that is truly compelling for I think the rising generation of Americans. And I think it's just inevitable that we'll get there. It's not inevitable without work, but I think that that's, that's exciting for me as well. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Emily, and everyone behind the scenes. Thanks to all of you for joining us for your participation. We will post the recording for this webinar on our YouTube page this week. And since you RSVP to be here, you will receive an email with a link to the recording once it is up and posted. Stay tuned for more webinars in the coming months and uh, keep following us on all of the social feeds to hear more about all of the exciting 30th anniversary activities and events that we have planned. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you all again real soon. Good night. Thanks everyone. Thanks all.